So um, I'm Angela and a very nice introduction. Thank you so much. Um, these are my disclosures. I um, consult for a number of companies and also have research funding. I think most of you are probably familiar with you know, von Willebrand's disease being the most common um, genetic bleeding disorder um, caused by either a missing or defective um, von Willebrand's factor. We think it affects up to 1% of the population, but it's actually really hard because I think there are a lot of people that are not diagnosed until much later in life or really never diagnosed. Um, and I think a lot of patients are missed, especially women whose symptoms oftentimes can be dismissed. Um, we know that genetically it occurs equally in women and men, um, but that uh, there's definitely differences in terms of when they're diagnosed and the symptoms they present with. So one thing that I have always thought, and um, Dr. Paula James and I wrote a paper about this a few years back, is that um, one thing that I think is really problematic in the bleeding disorders community, and I'm probably preaching to the choir here, but I think that um, like systemic sexism really affects um, the resources and um, things that um, end up going toward uh, diseases, especially that affect women. And I think a lot of this starts with the fact that menstruation is so stigmatized. Um, so we know that um, going back to like very old uh, religious texts, you know, there are negative things about menstruation and uh, the large religious texts. Um, and I think we haven't actually moved that far um, over the course of time. Like if you think about um, people still, you know, if you see tampon or pad commercials, like oftentimes the blood is like that light blue liquid to kind of show absorbency and um, people really don't like to talk about periods. Um, and so I think this really leads to our patients, but also like healthcare providers being somewhat unaware of really what constitutes a normal period. And because we know that, um, especially the Fomalibra disease, heavy menses can be one of the most common symptoms. This often I think leads to patients not being diagnosed um, or being diagnosed really um, much too late um, and having many years that they probably should have been treated and have not been treated. And studies have shown this to be the case. So um, here on the left, they actually did this very big international study and talked to just people in the world, like um, not physicians, not patients, just, just people in general. Um, and what they found was that when they talked to uh, parents of girls, so these are, you know, girls that are going to someday get their period. 41% um, of parents of girls never talk about menstruation with their daughters. And so these are little girls that are growing up and they're going to reach the age of menarche and have no idea, you know, what to expect or even what's going on the first time they bleed. We know that as doctors, we don't do a great job, especially, um, you know, I'm very focused on this. So I talk about this a lot in my clinics, but especially in primary care, um, it's been shown that less than 10% of pediatricians and family medicine doctors actually have like a detailed menstrual history within their notes. And then we also know that um, oftentimes women don't seek care for their heavy menstrual bleeding. So um, only four out of every 10 women with heavy menstrual bleeding actually go to the doctor and seek care um, for that problem. And that's probably due to a number of different reasons. I think sometimes they're not aware that the bleeding is actually abnormal. I think that they, maybe they've been dismissed before. Um, I think it is something that people don't necessarily feel comfortable talking um, to others about, especially if um, you know their doctor is not some, somebody that uh, makes them feel very comfortable. So unfortunately, I think you know this does lead to bleeding disorders in general, um, but especially von Willebrand's disease being underrecognized and underdiagnosed. Um, so we know um, that this is the case with von Willebrand's disease. So you look at men and women and their diagnosis of von Willebrand's disease, 50% um, of women affected by von Willebrand's disease are not diagnosed by the age of 12. And if you compare this to men, um, about 76% of men are diagnosed by the age of 10. So clearly a disconnect with um, boys with von Willebrand's disease being diagnosed earlier than girls. Um, on average, by the time a um, woman is diagnosed with von Willebrand's disease. She has six symptoms that can be attributed to von Willebrand's disease. And on average, there's about a 16 year delay between kind of the first symptom um, that can be, you know, retrospectively looked at and being said, this is abnormal um, and the eventual diagnosis on von Willebrand's disease. And to me, that's 
tragic, right? I mean, I see patients that are adolescents and I think about, you know, some of them only, only live 16 years, but to think about like 16 years of someone's life where they have a bleeding disorder um, that's not being adequately treated is, is really not okay and we have to do better. But unfortunately, I think because we underdiagnose um, women with bleeding disorders and von Willebrand's disease um, and their symptoms aren't necessarily recognized as abnormal um, and worked up appropriately. Um, a lot of the resources within the bleeding disorder community are dedicated to men and diseases that are associated with men, specifically hemophilia. And you're probably all quite aware of this um, if you look at, you know, all the big hemophilia groups. And um, even though, you know, I'm very interested in women with bleeding disorders and even women with hemophilia, um, I still, you know, when I talk to people, like so many people are just like, you know, women don't really have bleeding and, um, and that's even people within hematology. So that's, that's really disappointing. But if you look at just a comparison between hemophilia, which is something that historically has been thought to only affect men, or be it more of a male centric disease compared to von Willebrand's disease, which some people think is more of a um, you know, female disease. Um, von Willebrand's disease is many, many, many more times more common than von Willebrand's disease. Um, and even if you look at kind of severity, although a smaller proportion of patients with von Willebrand's disease are considered severe, um, the ab absolute numbers of patients with severe, or severe von Willebrand's disease are probably actually greater than the number of patients with hemophilia and severe disease. So you would think if you have a disease that's much more common, even in terms of the severe forms, um, that you would have more resources dedicated to that disease, but that's really not the case. So this, these are just some different graphs. And here is um, you know, a depiction of clinical trials. And so the purple are completed clinical trials and the red are ongoing and enrolling clinical trials. And even though von Willebrand's disease is much more common, so there's many more patients, um, as you can see, there are many more clinical trials in hemophilia A and hemophilia B. And that's actually separating hemophilia A and hemophilia B versus when you look at how many patients are affected um, and von Willebrand's disease is, is more than both of those combined. And unfortunately, we know that clinical trials are the way that medications and treatments are approved, you know, eventually get approved and are available for patients. Um, and so it's not surprising to see that um, those same sort of proportions continue on with, um, you know, approved products. So um, this is just um, the, you know, von Willebrand's disease is, is the um, light purple. And as you can see, there are, you know, fewer products for von Willebrand's disease um, than hemophilia A and hemophilia B. Um, and there's also just in terms of just general research being done. So looking at the disease itself and how patients are presenting, or even looking at very basic studies, looking at animals and, you know, trying to learn more about von Willebrand's disease in animals. Um, even in that area, there are many, many, many fewer publications um, or, you know, data and um, literature showing what we know in von Willebrand's disease compared to hemophilia A and hemophilia B. Unfortunately, this is not just a bleeding disorder problem. So this is shown outside of bleeding disorders as well. Um, when they do big international studies, they find that 90% of people in general have some bias against women, and that's including women um, can have, have bias against women. And I hear that from my own patients that um, I have young girls who say, you know, my doctor is a, a woman and she, she doesn't listen to what I say and she dismisses my symptoms. Um, over half of women um, feel that they experience some gender discrimination in seeing um, healthcare providers. Um, and in about 72% of diseases, they've shown that women are diagnosed later than men, um, despite having similar symptoms and presenting at similar ages to men. Um, they're still having quite a delay in their diagnosis. And I think, um, you know, all of that delay is time that that is spent not having adequate treatment um, of some pretty distressing symptoms. So, Back to von Willebrand's disease. Von Willebrand's disease has two main functions. Um, it carries and protects factor eight, um, which is a clotting factor in the blood. And it also serves as a bridge between platelets and um, injury sites in the blood vessel. Um, so it's really actually um, kind of a unique protein in that it kind of functions in two different parts of coagulation. Um, and because of that, it can really lead to um, very different bleeding um, based on, you know, levels of factor eight and levels of von Willebrand's factor.
So signs and symptoms of Von Willebrand's disease, you probably all are very familiar with um, a lot of this, um, frequent and prolonged nosebleeds, easy or abnormal bruising, um, excessive bleeding after surgery or dental work, heavy menstrual bleeding is the most common symptom that's reported in women that are affected by um, Von Willebrand's disease. And then in more severe cases, um, especially those cases where factor eight is also low, um, spontaneous bleeding into the joints and tissues can occur, very similar to um, what is seen in patients with hemophilia. Um, but I think a lot of what makes this challenging, um, and I don't know if you all had, had these experiences, but um, a lot of the symptoms are somewhat subjective. And because Von Willebrand's disease is a genetic disorder, if your mom is affected by von Willebrand's disease and she had heavy periods and her mom had heavy periods. Oftentimes I see patients and they say, yes, I have heavy periods, but that's just what my family has. Like that's just my family. And um, it's not necessarily recognized that um, there could be an underlying cause of that um, that should be diagnosed and could be, could be treated and that people don't necessarily have to suffer through really awful periods. Um, so in general, you know, there's three different types of Von Willebrand's disease, um, type one, which is the most common, where you just have low levels, but your Von Willebrand factor functions normally. Type two, where you have normal amounts, um, but you have various different functional um, defects. So you may have a problem with binding factor eight, you may have a problem with binding um, platelets. Um, and then type three, which is basically the absence of Von Willebrand's factor. Um, and generally with those patients also have low factor eight, um, so often have joint bleeding as well as the kind of mucocutaneous bleeding like heavy periods and nosebleeds. Um, and that is the most rare type um, and is um, typically, um, is always actually inherited in nosomal recessive fashion. So that's not something where, you know, your mom would have it and you would have it too. Um, you would typically have two unaffected parents. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the diagnosis guidelines. So um, I had a chance to be a part of um, the guidelines for management, not for diagnosis, but um, these were really incredible undertakings. So this actually, these processes started back in 2017. Um, and even before that, where um, this was basically, the idea was that there were a lot of different guidelines um, from different countries and they didn't necessarily match up. A lot of them had very different definitions for von Willebrand's disease. And people really felt like that was challenging, right? So if you were in the UK and you were seen by someone diagnosed with von Willebrand's disease, maybe if you moved to a different country, they would say, oh, you don't actually have von Willebrand's disease. You don't meet criteria. You know, you, you're not going to be treated or, or vice versa, right? You might have never been diagnosed somewhere else, even despite having lab testing um, and then go someplace and they say, no, actually, you know, you do meet the criteria. So the National Hemophilia Foundation, ISTH, which is the International Society for Thrombosis and Hemostasis, the World Federation of Hemophilia, um, and um, I'm missing one. In the American Society of Hematology, all came together. Um, there were patient representatives on both guideline panels. Um, there was actually a huge international survey that was put out prior to starting the guidelines, um, asking patients and healthcare providers and you know anybody invested in the community what kinds of questions they would like to see um, answered within these guidelines. Um, and then, as I mentioned, it was a very long process, very rigorous process, where a lot of evidence and a lot of data. Um, was reviewed in order to come, you know, to these recommendations. And this is just kind of an outline of what was ultimately recommended um, in terms of diagnosis. So um, the first diagnosis guideline was on these like bleeding assessment tools, which you may or may not um, be aware of. You know, you may have been given one of these before, but um, there are a number of different validated tools, which basically are just questionnaires. Um, some of them patients can do on their own. Some of them you know, a healthcare provider would sit down and ask you the questions, um, but they basically ask questions on the types of bleeding you've had, what kind of treatment that bleeding has required. Um, and basically the first, you know, question that the diagnosis panel wanted to answer was, you know, how do we use these in the diagnosis of von Willebrand's disease? And what they ultimately came to was that um, if you are someone who makes it to a hematologist, so someone's concerned enough to refer you to a hematologist, or you have a family history of von Willebrand's disease, that no matter what your bleeding assessment tool says, you should just have laboratory testing done. Versus if you're someone who goes to your primary care doctor and um, don't, you know, you don't have a history of um, von Willebrand's in your family, or you don't have, um, you know, any 
anybody related to you basically that has von Willebrand's disease, um, that a primary care doctor could start with this and give you a bleeding assessment tool. And if it was completely normal, um, then they wouldn't necessarily need to go on and do testing for von Willebrand's disease. Um, so that was kind of the first diagnostic thing. And then they kind of get into the testing itself. And so with a positive screen, um, you know, what testing should be done. Um, and so, you know, ultimately all of uh, all patients who are being worked up for von Willebrand's disease should have a von Willebrand factor antigen, which is basically just a, a marker of how much of von Willebrand factor you have. It doesn't tell you how well it's working. Um, and then platelet dependent VWF activity, which tells you a measure of how it's working and then a factor eight level. And so um, some of the, you know, big um, recommendations that came out of these diagnostic guidelines, as I mentioned, was the use of the bleeding assessment tools. Um, a big one was this harmonized definition of von Willebrand's disease. So prior to these guidelines, um, there were a lot of different cutoffs for um, what qualified as von Willebrand's disease. So this is just kind of an overview of some of those. So there were UK guidelines where you needed a um, level of less than 30%. Um, there were NHLBI, which is actually through the United States, through the NIH. They also thought you should have a level less than 30%. There were a few different groups that thought you should have a level less than 40%. And then there was one group that really um, didn't have like a cutoff um, for, for everyone, but said that based on your specific lab, um, that they should make a normal curve and, and do it based on how you compare to other people that have been drawn in that lab. Um, and for all of these guidelines that said that it had to be less than 30 or less than 40, there previously was um, this condition or diagnosis that was being used called low von Willebrand state which basically was you don't meet criteria for von Willebrand's disease, but your level is lower than normal or lower than 50%. Um, but this was especially problematic in the United States because a lot of these patients weren't able to get coverage, insurance coverage for um, their bleeding care. And so um, after looking at all the data, um, the diagnosis panel decided ultimately that um, they would define von Willebrand's disease as if you have bleeding and you're factor levels are less than 50%, then you have a diagnosis of von Willebrand's disease. Um, but if for some reason you had testing done without having bleeding, um, that you would need a level of 30% or below. Um, although one would kind of question why someone was having von Willebrand factor levels <laughs> without any bleeding. Um, but if, if that happened for some reason, they wouldn't necessarily consider uh, between 30 and 50 von Willebrand's disease. And then um, another thing that the guidelines touched on is something that has been a big issue in the United States. So um, as I mentioned, if you get testing done for von Willebrand's disease, um, most of you, I assume, have probably had, um, like I said, an antigen level, which is just the amount of von Willebrand's factor that's um, you know floating around in your blood vessels, and then the platelet binding activity. And in the United States, and actually in most of the world, historically, that's been a test called risicetin cofactor assay. And that has been what has been available. And in the United States, that's been really the only thing that was FDA approved until this past fall. But with the guidelines, um, they actually looked at that and looked at all the data around that and actually looked at some newer assays, one of which is called GP1BM, um, which just basically also measures that binding of von Willebrand's factor to platelets, um, but does it kind of in a better way. Um, and they actually recommended, and the guidelines came out in like early 2021. And so the guidelines came out and said, this should be the preferred testing. You shouldn't be doing risicetin. But this is really hard because even at institutions like mine, like it's not FDA approved. So people weren't necessarily able to do it. Um, a number of different centers um, were doing it, but sending the specimens to Versity, which is in Milwaukee and has a very big von Willebrand's factor diagnostic lab. Um, but it did cause a lot of problems, I think, for a lot of places where, you know, we want to be doing what the right thing is and what the guidelines are saying is, is the best thing to do, but it, it previously was not available. With the FDA approval, which was just in the fall of last year, um, this should become increasingly available across the United States um, and hopefully will be more and more used, especially with the guidelines recommending it. And really the issue with risicetin is a, a couple of different problems. So one is that it's really highly variable. And so um, if you check it you know, in one lab or on a different day or whatnot, it, it can be very, very different even within the same patient. 
It also is really not super reliable at very low levels. So if you're someone who has levels, um, you know, you've been told like your activity is less than 10%, they're not really able, it's not really able to differentiate like 10% from zero or 1%. Um, and so it's not super helpful um, when you get to those very low levels. And then there's also um, kind of a benign genetic change that's seen in um, some patients, most commonly African-American patients, um, that can make this test result abnormal, but does not mean you have vomit liver disease. And so it does have a problem where a number of patients um, are kind of misdiagnosed unless you send um, additional testing. So that's been problematic um, using risacine, but hopefully, as I said, since this new assay is approved um, by the FDA, um, more and more centers will hopefully begin to use that. And then a few other things. Um, one big thing was um, what to do with patients who um, kind of outgrow their von Willebrand's disease diagnosis. And so um, this is something that we have known for a long time that especially in certain types of von Willebrand's disease, most commonly type one disease that levels in all people, including those people with von Willebrand's disease go up as you age. Um, and what should we do with those patients? If you start out and you know, you're 16 and you're diagnosed and your level is less than 50%, but then you get to be 40 and now your level is 55%, does that mean you don't have von Willebrand's disease anymore? Um, and you know, I think it's real. this was a really important one. And I think this is one that a lot of people in the community that I've spoken with were, were worried about um, because um, there are a lot of patients who outgrow, quote unquote, their diagnosis in terms of their labs, but they're still having the very same bleeding symptoms that they were having before. Um, and just because their levels are now normal, um, probably it means that we're not, you know, using the correct reference ranges, right? Like if everyone's levels go up as they age, we probably should have different ranges for different ages, but we don't. Um, and this slide is just kind of showing a number of different um, studies um, that basically have shown that in type one patients, um, there is increase in levels over time and a, you know, not small proportion of patients will normalize their levels, um, but most studies don't actually show any change in their bleeding symptoms, um, which indicates that probably we all, whether we have normal Brand's disease or not, require higher levels as we get older, um, and we shouldn't be removing diagnoses if patients are still having symptoms. Um, versus type two patients where there's not actually um, seen as much an increase in levels, um, and a lot of those patients actually have increased bleeding um, with aging, which again, I think kind of highlights that probably all patients, regardless of von Willebrand's disease, regardless of what type, or even people without von Willebrand's disease, I think we probably need higher levels as we get older. Um, and so it's not appropriate to take away diagnoses, especially if people are still having bleeding. Um, so basically the recommendation was to kind of reconsider it, to you know look at patients and like, if your levels are now normal and you haven't had a bleeding symptom in 30 years, then maybe um, you know, that diagnosis was incorrect to begin with, but um, I think for a lot of patients, um, despite their levels becoming normal, um, they still should have um, that same diagnosis. Um, other kind of diagnostic guidelines that they talked about was like very specific testing um, based on the subtype that is um, suspected in patients. Um, so type 1C is a type where um, you have low levels, but the reason why you have low levels is not because your body doesn't make enough, but actually because your body clears it too quickly. Um, and so those patients, it's recommended that they undergo a desmopressin or DDABP trial um, to make sure that their levels go up and don't go down too quickly. For patients with um, suspected 2M, 2A, or 2B, um, it's recommended either multiple analysis um, or collagen binding. These are difficult. Um, all of the ones that have the little asterisks by them are tests that generally for almost, um, you know, probably 95% of the places you go, if not higher, um, it's going to be send out testing. This isn't testing that's done at a lot of different places. Um, for multimers, there's, I think, like two or three different labs in the U.S. that do them. Um, collagen binding is a little bit more frequent than that. Um, for type 2B, uh, targeted genetic testing is recommended, and that's also a send out um, for most places. And then for type 2N, um, they recommended either genetic testing or a specific von Willebrand factor, factor 8 
binding um, assay. So most of those tests are things that depending on the center you are at, most centers are going to be send out testing, um, but they are very, you know, when the panel was making these recommendations, they are tests that there's no issue with it being a send out. There's no problem with it being drawn in one location and, and shipped, and those are still very valid results. And so there shouldn't be any reason why people can't get these whatever center they happen to, to be followed at. And so I wanted to talk a little, I think there were some questions ahead of time about like dual diagnosis and, um, you know, what about patients um, like who may have multiple disorders. Um, and I think this is something that really in the bleeding disorders community is somewhat overlooked. I think that oftentimes when patients come in and they have bleeding, we send some tests and then if, you know, one, one of the first tests we send comes back positive and says, oh, you have vulnerable liberance disease. I think for a lot of healthcare providers, it kind of stops there. It says, okay, you have vulnerable liberance disease that can explain your symptoms. Um, but there's actually pretty considerable overlap um, with not only platelet function defects, but also collagen disorders like Ehlers-Danlos where you can have hypermobility. And then there's also, I think, overlap with just other bleeding disorders, right? Like hemophilia and factor deficiencies. Um, and so I think it's important um, that we consider that um, when these are just a few different studies that have shown, um, you know, they looked at bleeding disorder patients um, and also controls that didn't have bleeding disorders. Um, and about a quarter of all bleeding disorder patients in this study actually had um, symptomatic joint hypermobility. And so that's kind of a marker that your um, collagen isn't working completely normally. Um, and because collagen is also involved in that von Willebrand um, interaction, that can cause your bleeding to be more severe. Um, and so typically if you have von Willebrand's disease in addition to another bleeding disorder, um, your bleeding is going to be more severe or maybe kind of atypical for von Willebrand's disease. Um, and then this other study found that about um, one and a half percent of patients with von Willebrand's disease um, had a second additional bleeding disorder. But even that study, you know, remarked that I think a lot of patients don't get the full workup if one of their tests comes back positive. Um, and so probably were under diagnosing um, other bleeding disorders, especially in patients with von Willebrand's disease. So things that I think, um, you know, kind of can signal that um, maybe there's additional diagnoses or atypical laboratory findings. So this we definitely see, um, especially in people with hemophilia and von Willebrand's disease, um, if they have really severe bleeding disorder, bleeding symptoms, especially compared to their levels or atypical bleeding symptoms. Um, some patients are found because they're treated with von Willebrand factor and they don't necessarily respond in the way that um, we would expect them to. Oftentimes it can be an unusual inheritance pattern um, or, you know, easiest situation, I think, is if like another family member, um, you know, has a known diagnosis. And then I think it's more likely that the physician um, would, would check for that. I just saw that I missed something in the chat. So Dina asked, at what point is genetic testing done from personal experience and minimization? Genetic testing was key to learn more and obtain a clearer picture. Yes. So I think um, historically, so I guess the, I guess there would be two questions like, at what point is it done? I think historically it hasn't really been done. And oftentimes like a lot of patients didn't have any um, genetic testing, which I think um, is not great, especially for some of the patients that um, really would have benefited from genetic testing. Um, I think for um, when, when should it be done? Um, you know, I think in this, I'm just gonna go back to my slides a little bit. In this kind of algorithm of when you're doing your testing, um, once kind of your levels come back, um, you know, and, and doctors are looking at like where they think you kind of fall in the, you know, types, um, I think typically that's when, you know, it ideally is done. Um, and I think depending on the type, you know, it can be more or less helpful. We do know like in type one von Willebrand's disease, which is the most common type, actually a lot of patients don't have any genetic mutation. That doesn't mean they don't have von Willebrand's disease. It just means they don't have a genetic mutation. And so for those patients, sometimes it can be less helpful um, to do genetic testing. But I think, um, you know, in type three, it's very helpful. In type two B, it's very helpful. Um, in type two N, it can be helpful. Um, type two A, I mean, I think it can be helpful in really most type two and, and type three patients. Um, and I would be interested if you wanted to share later or now um, about how like that personally affected kind of your um, care, like what benefit you saw 
So in my situation, I was diagnosed with type one von Willebrand and through genetic testing, I have one variant of uncertain significance. Okay. The other, I cannot convert tyrosine to citrosine. Okay. So it's more of a qualitative defect. And I can't remember, I think it was at like 14%. I have a 40% eight and I did genetic testing with Dr. Nugent on the factor seven front. Um, so I'm zero. Yeah. That's yeah. A qual no, and, that's I qualitative. Think, and I think with that too, that can be, you know, especially with multiple disorders, I think it can be so helpful too, just to kind of, I think it can be difficult to tease out, um, like what is causing what and how much of a role all of these things are playing, right? Like if you're having bleeding, how much is your factor seven versus your factor eight versus your VWF, um, you know, contributing to things. And sometimes our laboratory assays um, aren't necessarily. But I think, reflective. you know, I, I just do you think that, you know, I, I just get this, the sensation that there's still a lot more to learn. Oh, and I think absolutely. that, I think that we're so married to type one, type two and type three. I just, I'm really starting to look at this from more of a genomic perspective. Yeah. And I really think it's much more necessary than any of us ever had imagined. Yeah. And I think it's, it's difficult. Um, I completely agree with you with like the type one and two. I think about that all the time, because especially with patients um, that have like normal multimers, like if you're type two M or type one, I have many patients who, um, you know, that's basically the differentiating factor is like a ratio. And oftentimes like one day their ratio would qualify them to be type one. And one day their ratio would qualify them to be type two M and, and, and you know, clearly the patient hasn't changed. Um, their diagnosis isn't changing. Right. But like, based on how we qualify them. Um, so, so I think it's definitely an imperfect system. I think what is challenging is we know that there's so many genes outside of von Willebrand's factor that contribute to your levels, um, that, that makes it a little harder because they're not, um, and people like Jorge de Paula in at Wash U are doing things to try to make like all of these different genes, like testable all within kind of one test, um, because we do know that, um, you know, even patients who don't have like a genetic mutation in VWF may have genetic mutations in other genes that affect, you know, how your VWF is cleared or how your VWF is secreted or, or any of those things. Um, so I think even looking at it in a genomic way is so good, but I think it, like you can't even just look at like just the VWF gene. Um, there's so many other factors at play. It's very interesting. My brain hurts trying to think, trying to figure <laughs> it out. And we still don't have me figured out. So, yeah, I yeah. mean, we do. I mean, we're getting there. It's better. Yeah. Well, and Diane Nugent's incredible. And I feel like genetic testing, like, especially for seven, she's, she's the person like that everyone sends everything to her, to her for. She's phenomenal. Okay. We love yeah. her. She's great. Um, okay. So I'm going to go back where was I? Um, so yeah um, suspecting other diagnoses. And then, um, these are just kind of the tests that, you know, typically would be done in any patient that is having bleeding, um, to kind of start their workup. Um, and this is just kind of an illustration for, um, those joint hypermobility syndromes where patients have, and these are actually, um, if you can believe it, even more frustrating from a diagnosis perspective, um, because things like earlier stanlos, most of those patients don't, um, there's not genetic testing for. And so you can do this test and show that you're hypermobile and can do weird things like I can, but it doesn't, um, there's not like a laboratory test or anything that correlates with that. And there's not actually um, great specific treatments for um, collagen disorders either. Um, so um, moving on to different treatments, um, you know, there are factor treatments, video of concentrates. Um, I think that um, these are great and work very well, but, you know, are invasive and require recurrent IV administration and um, can be expensive. Um, hopefully insurance will be covering those more and more. TDAVP, um, which has been problematic recently as far as like the intranasal form, um, but there's also an IV form, um, but has variable effectiveness depending on what type of von Willebrand's disease you have. Um, and then also is associated, I don't know if any of you have used TDAVP, but I have a number of patients that, and actually the patients who are on the management panel with me um, were very, very um, vocal about how much they hated DDAVP and the way it made them feel. Um, so I think depending on, on the patient, um, patients can, can 
really dislike that. Um, but also can have tachyphylaxis where it stops working over time um, because it basically causes um, stimulates your body to release its von Willebrand's factor, but um, at some point there's no more to release. And then there's also adjunctive medications such as hormones and antifibrinolytics, which can be helpful for more mild bleeding or specific types of bleeding, um, but have pretty variable side effects. And then I was just going to touch on some of the management guidelines. So, um, you know, the big one that we started out with was just, you know, that we should be using uh, factor prophylaxis in patients with severe recurrent bleeding. Um, this is, you know, kind of a vague statement um, because there's not great definitions for like who would be best to um, benefit. And we wanted to leave it somewhat vague as well so that patients were able to access this more easily um, if they're, they and their providers felt like they would benefit. Uh, we talked about that patients should have a desmopressin trial uh, before using it. Um, and then, you know, some specific recommendations on minor procedures and major surgeries, um, kind of what to monitor and, and what um, medications to use. Um, and then, you know, I think it's really exciting in all of the bleeding disorder communities that um, we're having more and more patients that are living to old ages and are um, requiring treatments with um, oftentimes treatments that we would um, not love to use would not be our first choice in patients with bleeding disorders, such as like anticoagulants and um, antiplatelets. I just saw the other comment I missed, Kathy, hyperextension of your joints and used CDAVP for years. Did you, and so you didn't have any issues with it. It didn't make you feel horrible, hopefully. Excuse me, but I had no choice. Yeah. I had no choice. Um, my choices for treatment were very limited. I was not diagnosed until I was 47 years old. And I actually still have all of my parts and went through a normal menopause, however normal that can be. So there are things to be celebrated. However, um, DDAVP made me feel better than bleeding to death. Yeah. There you right. Go. If that's the choice, right. That was <laughs> Everyone's going to pick that. Right. Yeah. And yeah. I've had major surgery and all sorts of other things as I've gotten older that have really complicated things, including um, becoming overcoagulated um, after open heart surgery. But I don't mean to um, to dominate here, but I'm very, very interested in what happens to us after we are no longer of a reproductive age. And yeah. I have been told more times than I want to hear that I have aged out. And I intend on being very old when I die and continuing to be very vocal about the fact that I still have a bleeding disorder. And I have yeah. had higher life. And I'm very grateful that I am still alive. And I'm appreciative that technology is catching up to all of us so yay I'll yeah. be <laughs> just just out of curiosity with not being diagnosed till you're 47 when do you feel like your first like bleeding like if looking back like the first time you had like abnormal bleeding was um when I had my tonsils out at age six right so um, 41 years correct and I diagnosed myself um, and took myself to the hemophilia treatment center and asked for proper testing. And I don't know if you know who Renee Paper is. Um, Renee and Renee worked many years to have a two or three pages put in the back of the hysterectomy um, guidelines from the US government. And my sister sent that to me because every doctor I had wanted to give me a hysterectomy. Wow. And so after reading that, I realized there was much more to what was going on with me and had been for a number of years. Yeah. And so I did what was suggested and took myself and had myself tested. And Barb Force and I were two of the original women who started actually getting treatment at our hemophilia treatment center wow. in Seattle. So we've come a long, long ways, but believe me, we have not finished our work. And the- No, we're close. 
Well, right? and the problems that I had with major surgery, I had open heart surgery. And part of the reason that I was having problems, I had developed von Willebrand's type two because I had a tear in my heart valve and it was shredding my von Willebrand's factor. So once I had my heart repaired and I was no longer shredding what little von Willebrand's factor I had and I was receiving Humate P, I became overcoagulated three different times and had to inform my medical staff that I was having a stroke, unbeknownst to them. And I was told I wouldn't recognize it if I had a stroke. And so I had to demonstrate that I was actually having a stroke. So even though I no longer am of a reproductive age, it's really important for me to know how to be properly coagulated. And I literally had to refuse my humic pee because I figured out what was going on. And my hematologists now don't really know what to do with me because they don't want me to do the DDAVP anymore. Um, I am kind of a complex issue and my diagnosis came early on where I was told I might have von Willebrand's too, but at that time, the only way they could diagnose me was they knew I was a one, but they went, well, the treatment would be the same. So anyway, I am monopolizing your time here, but I'm very interested in, um, women especially who are no longer of a reproductive age and still have not only, you know, they only maybe have five symptoms rather than six. Right. right. But I think even um, it's also, I think really interesting. And I think being appreciated more and more, like even that perimenopausal time, right. I think that like you talk about, we don't talk about periods, but then it's like, even thinking about like peri like perimenopause, what that's supposed to look like for people, even without von Willebrand's disease, let alone with von Willebrand's disease. And we know there's all of these issues that are even less talked about than regular periods, and no one has any idea what to expect. Whether you know, um, I I literally am the only woman I know of my age who has a bleeding disorder who still has their their uterus. Mm -hmm. their uterus ovaries, fallopian yeah. tubes, the whole shebangy. Yeah. And I think, so. I think it will be interesting to see over time. Cause I think hopefully that is changing somewhat. I, I see so many adolescents that, um, I see them and, uh, you know, they have very heavy periods and, and have von Willebrand's disease or another bleeding disorder. And then their mom is like, like, Oh, well, you know, I had a hysterectomy when I was 25 and I'm like, wait, wait what? <laughs> like, like what? Right. But like that used to be I mean, and probably in a lot of places still is like just the go-to of you're, you're bleeding so much. We just have to take it out and, you know, was never, you know, tested for anything, but, um, then I diagnosed the mom and send them to my adult colleagues. Well, thank you for your time. And we of may course. be talking. Of course. Um, so other kind of things we, we, you know, address in the guidelines were, uh, management of heavy menstrual bleeding with either antifibrinolytics or hormones. The use of antifibrinolytics. And so antifibrinolytics, I'm talking about like Lysetta or Amacar, um, which both kind of stabilize clots once they're formed. Um, and then also, you know, how to best um, give patients with von Willebrand's disease epidural anesthesia in terms of targeting um, von Willebrand factor levels. So, um, you know, thinking about our patients and um, luckily, you know, patients with von Willebrand's disease are living to old ages and um, oftentimes will have situations, you know, like Kathy mentioned of, um, you know, if you have a stroke or if you have a DVT, like a blood clot in your leg or a pulmonary embolism in your lungs, or maybe you have atrial fibrillation that you need you know, a blood thinner for, um, this is really challenging in patients who um, already have a high bleeding risk to start them on a medication that um, also has a very high bleeding risk. Um, but we really felt like it was very important. And I think we definitely, um, you know, feel this way at my center about like all of our patients with bleeding disorders that um, their bleeding disorders should not preclude them from getting like appropriate medical care, um, you know, for other conditions, right? Like, we should be able to support them through a surgery if they need a surgery. Like it drives me crazy. Sometimes surgeons will be like, well, 
I think they should have this, but since they have bone liver disease, we won't do it. I'm like, no, no, like, you know, we need to provide appropriate care to our patients and, you know, we should have the tools to, to support people through that. Um, so really our recommendation was, you know, patients with bone liver disease should be able to receive anti- coagulants, blood thinners, or antiplatelets like aspirin, um, but that really our job as hematologists is really to support them through that. And so maybe patients are going to need factor prophylaxis or DVAVP or, you know, other treatments um, in order for them to tolerate um, those medications that put them at greater risk um, for bleeding. And then I think also as our patients are getting older, you know, pain um, is, is definitely an issue, I think, for people in general, but especially people with bleeding disorders, um, and it can be really problematic. I'm sure most of you have probably been told at one time or another not to use things like NSAIDs, ibuprofen, aspirin, because um, they do have bleeding risk. Um, but that is really problematic, especially because there are certain types of pain um, that really responds best to those sorts of medications and may not respond well to Tylenol or um, other things. Um, you know, studies, people who do lots of studies in pain medicine have really found kind of multimodal approaches to be the most successful. So with bleeding disorders, you know, treating bleeding appropriately, um, there are things, you know, like biofeedback and um, some like psychological tools that can be helpful with pain, systemic pain control, um, whether that's um, Tylenol or, um, opioids or, you know, whatever that needs to be. Um, and then complementary um, methods as well, like things like massage and some of those things that can uh, be helpful for pain as well. Um, there is in the bleeding community, um, a little bit of a trend towards using more like topical NSAIDs, which can be quite helpful for pain, um, but don't have that systemic bleeding risk. Um, so, so those definitely can be used. And then there also are um, specific NSAIDs um, that have a lower bleeding risk um, than the others. So those would be COX-2 inhibitors or things like Celecoxib, Celebrex, um, which can uh, be used, you know, a little more safely than um, something like ibuprofen. Um, and then, you know, for more severe pain, there are the opioid analgesics as well, um, although those aren't so good for kind of longer term um, if you can avoid them. Exercise wise, um, I think, you know, within the bleeding disorders community, all bleeding disorders, um, you know, we know for all people, exercise is really important for overall health, but within bleeding disorders, um, it can be really important in terms of retaining or even regaining like joint function, um, really trying to keep mobility, um, not lose any of that mobility um, and can really improve your quality of life. Um, I think it can be tough for a lot of our patients with bleeding disorders, figuring out the best type of exercise to engage in. This is just like a page from the NHF. They have a booklet called Playing It Safe that kind of goes over different activities and kind of their risk for bleeding. Um, so clearly, you know, we're not huge fans of football, type of football. Hopefully none of you are too into that. Um, I always tell my adolescent girls, I'm like, I hope you're not doing ultimate fighting. And they kind of laugh at me, but, um, you know, you have to ask, cause like every once in a while, I want to be like, oh yeah, I like to box. And I'm like, who are you boxing? Like, where, where is this happening? I don't understand like why you want someone to hit you in the face, but, um, this can be kind of a helpful guide in terms of, um, helping figure out kind of bleeding risk and, and what activities might be good. But I think really the biggest thing I think is, um, I personally think, especially living in Michigan in wintertime, um, exercise and movement can be difficult. And so whatever is going to, you know, motivate you and what makes you, you know, excited to do it is going to be going to be the best thing. Um, there was a question about supplements. Um, there haven't been like great studies to show like anything specific for von Willebrand's disease to be helpful. Um, but what I would say is it is really, really helpful um, to talk to your doctor or your healthcare provider uh, before starting anything. Um, there are things kind of on the market that actually can really increase your bleeding risk um, and things that you wouldn't necessarily think of um, as being an issue. But these are just a number of supplements that have been shown to increase bleeding risk. Um, you know, some of them may be fine in, in certain doses. And so it's not to say like you can never have vitamin E or fish oil or something, but um, I would just, you know, touch base with your healthcare provider um, and make sure you're not taking something that would increase your risk for bleeding. Um, one thing I think is really um, difficult when I talk to people, especially people who aren't necessarily um, always being seen at like hemophilia treatment centers um, or who have seen many, many doctors before they're like eventually diagnosed um, or may not feel that their physicians are 
listening to them um, or taking their complaints seriously um, is kind of advocating for your own treatment. And I hate that this has to be like a discussion, but I feel like I just talked to enough patients that um, it feels like many patients are in that situation. Like I wish that all doctors um, would really be aware of all of our disease and be aware of, you know, all the symptoms that can be associated and um, not dismiss symptoms, but that sadly is just not the case. Um, so when I talk to patients and, you know, like how, how do I get, like, I have people ask me like, how do I get prophylaxis? Like, I think I need prophylaxis and no one, you know, wants to prescribe me prophylaxis, or I think I need a different treatment regimen. I really think that, um, data and like details are really like your ally and can be so helpful in these situations. Um, you know, yourself and your symptoms better than anyone. Um, but I think, bringing in like concrete and it, I'm not saying data like um like it can just be a notebook right where you say like this day this happened and this day this happened and this day this happened and I think you know having that documentation can not can be helpful not only for like advocating to your healthcare provider but um can also be helpful for them when they're trying to advocate like to your insurance company for like a prior auth or something um because having that documentation of you know, this is a recurring issue, or this is like the severity of the issue, um, can be can be incredibly helpful. And then I think, um, you know, literature and articles can also be helpful. I think a lot of um, people I've talked to at various conferences, um, you know, have said like, well, you know, what if like I haven't had the right testing or whatever. Like there are these more recent guidelines that were all published in 2021 and they're open access. So it's a journal that you can go to yourself actually and um, get the full article yourself. It's not something that like you have to have access or pay for. Um, so it, they're freely available and you can print that out and go and say like, hey, like I didn't have this test done. And they say, this is like the right test for me. And, um, and it's a big international document, right? That is like the world's experts putting their heads together and saying, this is what should be done. And I think um, that can go far with physicians who may just not know, you know, the right thing to do. Um, and it can also go far with like health insurance companies. So um, since being on the guideline panel um, and having the diagnosis guidelines um, published, I like use that all the time as far as like prior auths. Like I just have like it in my files and I um, attach it to prior auths all the time because um, it can be helpful for getting things paid for. And then I was going to go through really quickly. There are like ongoing studies if people are interested. There's BWD Connect Foundation, which is a big patient organization. There's ongoing patient registries. Um, although von Willebrand's disease is like very um, underfunded and under-resourced, there are new treatments that are maybe coming down the line in, in, in you know, future years. Emicizumab is one that's currently used for hemophilia, but there's an open trial um, looking at that. It's a subcutaneous injection. There's another subcutaneous injection that um, is kind of earlier in development, but is hopefully going to be starting trials soon. Um, all of them actually uh, happen to be subcutaneous injections, but here's another one that is specifically um, actually binds BWF and also binds albumin. So just keeps your von Willebrand's factor around a little bit longer and can be helpful for patients who have premature clearance where their body clears out their von Willebrand's factor. And then there's another one that's just um, also has a long half-life and is specifically hopefully going to be helpful in type 2B patients. Most of these are still very early kind of in um, animal models, but um, they're talking about them at conferences and I, I'm excited that at least there seems to be like more interest in um, new therapies because uh, when you look at the ones we have, you know, there's so few. Um, and I feel like, you know, as Kathy was saying, it's like DDAVP or bleed out and those aren't good options. Um, so, um, hopefully more and more of these will come out. Um, but I did want to leave time for questions and discussion. Um, if there are things that like I didn't cover that you were hoping to talk about, I'm happy to talk about anything related to Bamala Brand's disease, um, or anything, anything at all. I'm not sure if you've seen this, Angela, but um, Stacy just asked, are there links to the studies? Um, to like the, for the new drugs? Is that what you're referring to, Stacy? Yeah, it's what you were just talking about. Um, the new drugs and the things that are just in production. I like reading and staying up on everything. Are there any links that you know or? Yeah, so um, I can send, maybe Joan, could I like send you like an email with the things that I have? So some of them, there actually are not, like some of them haven't even been kind of recording the literature, just have been like at- Oh, like, that's fine. 
at, at scientific talks, but um, I can send the ones that have, like there's a few that have just like little abstracts and meetings and stuff. Um, so I can send you everything that I have. That would be great. And Stacy, we'll make sure we get them to all of you. Did you all have issues with like getting diagnosed? Was that a frustrating drawn out process for people? It's very frustrating. So I've been diagnosed four different times. Oh my gosh. And the nurse is insistent that I don't have what the Mayo Clinic has diagnosed me with. So she's running the test yet again. I was so shocked when I joined this group to find out that there was such an issue with getting diagnosed. I am the third of four generations of type two Bs in my family. So we were misdiagnosed until I was 16 years old, but we all had the same misdiagnosis. And then as they discovered two and then two B and we were already diagnosed. They um, just told my niece that they were going to undiagnose her because she doesn't seem to have the levels within range. And I'm like, no. what in the world? I think it's really problematic too. Um, I'm giving a talk at one of our like big international meetings this summer where like the testing is so hard. We did a big study looking at like, if you go to a community center and they like draw your labs and then they send mm -hmm. them like, for the levels and then they send them somewhere else, like your levels are not really accurate and um, like stress can increase your levels, right? Hormones can increase, like there are all these different things that can increase your levels. And um, if people don't understand that when they're interpreting them, it's like, right. oh, your level's 50%. It's like, right. But also like they were really anemic and they were stressed out and like they're on, you know, oral contraceptive, which has hormones. Do you know what I mean? It's like, that's not really 50%. And I think um, right. so many people just look at like, was it flagged in the computer as abnormal? It's like, right. But what was the context? Like I see pediatric patients and, um, like every two-year-old has to get like hold, held down, right? To get labs drawn and they're like screaming their face off and they're stressed because they're being held down to be poked with a needle, right? And so right. if their levels are like barely normal, I'm like, well, clearly that's not like actually normal, right? Well, with her, they're saying it might be her blood type. Oh, um, no. She was, she was diagnosed young as well. My daughter is a type three. I think everybody knows her, but um and then she called me. She's like, yeah, they're going to undiagnose me because, you know, it might be my blood type. And I'm like, no. So, um, actually in the, in the diagnosis guidelines. So, um, I'll send you guys, um, with the other stuff, I can send you a link to the actual things and you can like print out the paper, but in the diagnosis guidelines, they actually like, um, address that because historically people have done that where they're like, you have type, Oh, it's okay. If you have low levels of all of us factor, but that's not actually probably true. And so in the guidelines, they say like, that's not like a legitimate thing to say mm -hmm. someone doesn't have home deliverance disease. Right. So they could maybe like your niece can maybe, you know, if you print that off or whatever, take that to our doctor and be like, no, this is not. Well, I mean, she, she doesn't really have many problems anymore. She doesn't need to lose some weight and she admits that she has dropped a lot of weight. Um, when she was younger, she used to have a lot of problems. And as she's gotten older, she seems to do better. So it's just kind of hit and miss. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think mom Lebron's disease is so hard for that reason it where, is. um, I meet patients and like, they clearly have mom Lebron's disease and their testing supports that. And they have heavy bleeding or whatever, but like maybe they had a surgery and the surgery went mm -hmm. fine. And mm -hmm. so they're like, no, I had surgery and I was fine. So I don't have, it's like, but it really is like, especially with surgery, so much of surgical bleeding is like how many vessels were in the right. area and like how well they cauterize the vessels. And so I've had patients like who had surgery and did fine and then had like a very similar surgery and like almost bled to death. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, clearly um, there are factors, you know, other factors that like contribute to bleeding, but it can make it hard for people as, even to accept like, oh no, you really do have a bleeding disorder, but they're like, oh no, like it's been fine. You know, I had surgery mm -hmm. once and I didn't have a problem. Well, I know with nice, I think we lost you. Can anybody else hear her? No, I think we lost her. I think we lost I her. Too. Right yeah, I think she's gone. Okay. Yeah. Did you want to ask a question? Well, I do have another question. So number a number of like I've had probably 15 people in my family do genetic testing. And it's now been recommended that the others do it as well. 
And I recently had my cousin had a heart attack. They gave him blood thinners because of the heart attack. And he ended up having a brain bleed and passing away. Do you think that that would be a pretty large contributing factor to an undiagnosed bleeding disorder? Or is that common for people just to have brain bleeds when they have a heart attack and have blood thinners? I mean, I think um, it's not super, super, I mean, it's not like unheard of in people that, that don't have bleeding disorders, but it would kind of depend on like the context, like, you know, if you needed like bypass, like, you know, what all. Yeah, I just, they just didn't get to that point. He had the blood thinners and then started the brain bleed pretty quick. And his sister did, she did test positive for the genes that I have. So it just makes me think a little bit more because, you know, I think, and that's the problem too, in big families, no one wants to believe that there's anything wrong with them. And, you know, and we've been, well, you know, I don't have any problems and it's, you know, it's the same thing. And, I could really identify with, oh, well, that's the way that we bleed. Right. Right. And I think, right. It's like, it's easy to dismiss things. And then most people have things too, where they're like, well, remember this happened and it wasn't an issue or, do you know what I mean? Or like, oh, I cut myself sometimes and I don't bleed that long. And it's like, well, that's not actually like proof. I remember being seven years old and falling off of the top bunk of the bunk bed. And my hand being just one solid bruise and taking months to heal. And I would say that that would be the the first thing that I could identify with other than nosebleeds. Yeah. And even that, I think people, I mean, we sometimes diagnose people and um, we diagnosed like a young man with hemophilia when he was like 19 and he would get these like huge hematomas because he played like competitive sports and we were like, did no one think that was weird that you have these like huge hematomas? And he's like, I don't know. Um, so even I think with bruising, it can be, sometimes people can dismiss that as well. Well, and I think we live in a very dismissive, you know, I try to count them out the amount of times that I say just, right. it's just this, it's just that it's just, yeah. and, and we're, and our brains are wired to minimize things. Yeah. And it's just being aware and having empathy and humility. And, you know, none of us know why, you know, for the smartest person in the room, we're clearly in the wrong room. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I think that there's just like so much to learn about all of it, right? Like um, if someone tells you like, oh, I know everything about bone liver disease, it's like, well, no, because that's like no one knows. You know, there's just like so much more to learn. I think anybody who like works with bone liver disease is like, I don't know anything because there's just like so many things that we don't understand um, and that we need to keep learning. And it's ever changing. And I mean, I know medicine is a science, but it seems like von Willebrand's is a worse science. You can't really check. It's just yeah. crazy. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I think that that makes it really hard to um, like, especially for families that are minimizing it. Right. And like, want to be like, there's nothing wrong with me. And then when you're like, well, also the testing is like really finicky and we mm-hmm. can't like, we can't say for sure. And we're going to have to test you when you're like off the hormones or we're going to, you know, it just makes it seem like this is all silly and I don't actually have something. Right. And see, I actually, I have more problems now than I ever did before. And it was, I had no choice, but to have a hysterectomy. Mm. Um, but I, the hormones from the, the birth control really, really kept me stable. And now I'm all over the place and the doctors won't give me anything. Mm. So if I go in for surgery or something, I, you know, I've got to beg for them. Well, and it's crazy. Um, there was a talk at one of our, at one of our big meetings and, um, this doctor said like, um, what I don't remember what the quote was like, um, men with hemophilia are like born with the right to like prophylaxis and treatment. Yep. And that like women with all over disease, like have to suffer mm-hmm. to like qualify for treatment. Do you know what I mean? Where it's just, it's like yeah, such like a backward saying. It's like, it's like, there's not really a reason that people want to, like, it's not like factor, like you're going to sell it on the street or like, it's going to make you high. Or, do you know what I mean? It's like, there's not really like a reason that people want it except for like, so that they won't bleed, 
Right. And see, and that's the thing, you know, my daughter is supposed to bet on Profi. When she moved, went to a new treatment center, like, oh, no, you don't need it. And she really had to fight to get it. And she finally got put back on Profi. I mean, she's almost 30 years old. She knows what she's doing. (laughs) It's just crazy, though. Yeah. Right. And like, why is there this like gatekeeping? Do you know what I'm saying? It's like, but I'll, I don't know. It's really frustrating. And I think that, you know, you feel like you have to constantly prove yourself. And like, that's how I felt for years. And the minimization um, and it, it treatment varies from doctor to doctor. Yeah. And I don't think that people realize how much medical trauma that that occurs. Yeah. And I mean, I think a lot of people in our community have, you know, complex PTSD because of this. Oh, absolutely. And I don't think that our community is, they're, they're not trauma informed and they don't understand that when you walk into, you know, that HTC, you're having, you're in a whole realm of trauma responses and people don't understand you. And so like, I know for myself, I have to speak up and say, I have, I have complex PTSD. I am going to probably have some trauma responses. I need you to understand that when we're having this conversation. Yeah. But it's amazing, right. That you can, like you said, like you, that you know that, and you can say that. And I think you're absolutely right that people don't necessarily always even recognize that. And I feel like for women, even outside of bleeding disorders, like that so, so many times is it, right. It's like, I didn't go to the doctor until it was like bad enough. And then the doctor was like, eh, it's not really like, you know, exercise. See, and sleep now, if more you, or, now if you only treated, we would love it if you would treat women in Michigan. Well, good to see you all. We hope to see you next month. Um, thank you for joining us and have a great weekend, everybody. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Have a good night. Bye. Take care.